Hey, what is up? This is Internet Law Review. I hope you are having a fantastic day today. We are going to be talking about this case that just came down from the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals today. This is Telescope Media Group versus Rebecca Lucero. And this is dealing with an issue of discrimination versus freedom of speech. So this is essentially a follow-on case to Masterpiece Cake Shop from Colorado from, I believe it's two years ago now, where, as we may remember, there was a bake shop in Colorado. A gay couple went to them to say, make us a wedding cake. They said no, and they went up to the U.S. Supreme Court on the issue. The U.S. Supreme Court punted, punted hard, meaning that they did not decide the actual issue. Instead, they said that the commission that initially found liability improperly discriminated against them based on an improper uh, hatred of religion. And so sent it back for essentially an underlying finding. Um, but that case is pretty much dead. But this case is a successor case to that. There have been quite a few successor cases. This is by no means the first. But it is one of the ones that has been decided by a court of appeals and also one that presents a much purer speech issue. And what I mean by that is you can think of different kinds of businesses that might be implicated on, in a wedding. So you, you know, maybe you get a custom suit made for you for your wedding day. Um, could that kind of business make a a First Amendment argument of, I don't want to make a suit for you for your wedding. That would be a much more difficult argument. I would actually say probably impossible because all the creative choices are almost always made by the client. The client says what kind of suit they want. They say what kind of uh, you know alterations they want. If it's bespoke, they say what kind of lining, what kind of buttons, you know, the whole bit. So there's not really creative choices being made by the tailor and that the ones that are not really speech. So if you're a custom suit manufacturer, you're going to have a really tough time. And I would say it's an impossible time to make a freedom of speech case. Um, on the extreme other end of the case, there are services that will write wedding vows for you, that will write best man or toast or wedding toast for you. Um, so, you know, maybe you want to make sure that the words that you're going to say are, you know, perfect for your day. They'll write vows for you. There are services like this. And, you know, you want someone that will take what you have and help you put it into even better vernacular than you could. So they'll sit down with you. Many times they'll interview you some extensively. Sometimes they'll interview your friends and they'll put together uh, words that express your feelings in, you know, very sort of um, heartfelt ways that will really, you know, win the day. And I think there it's very easy to make a freedom of speech case. You know, that's about as pure speech as it gets. So the, the cake shop is somewhere in between those two. And this, I think, is on the side closer to the, the Bards Are Us example. This is people being hired to videotape a wedding. So uh, it's not quite as pure as free speech as people being asked to write wedding vows on a commercial context. But it is much more similar to that than a person being asked to make a wedding dress or being asked to make a suit for a wedding. So we're going to read this decision. It's a two to one decision. Um, and apparently the dissent, I've not read this. We're going to read it in full together. And apparently the dissent had some very, very major points of dissent. So we're going to read both of it and see what we have to learn because I think it's a very interesting issue. And I think the cake example is so interesting because it's such a borderline case uh, between those two extremes. It's, it's a little bit hard to say, and it might come down to the particulars of the cake. But let's see what the situation is in this case. This was decided today. Telescope versus Rebecca Lucero in her official capacity as Commissioner of Minnesota Department of Human Rights. So let us read this and see what it has to say. And of course, there were three billion amicuses on this, as you would expect. Carl and Angel Larson wish to make wedding videos. Can Minnesota require them to produce videos of same-sex weddings, even if the message would conflict with their own beliefs? The district court concluded that it could and dismissed Larson's constitutional challenge to the Minnesota anti-discrimination law. Because the First Amendment allows the Larsons to choose when to speak and what to say, we reverse the dismissal of two of their claims and remand with instructions to consider whether they are entitled to a preliminary injunction. 
The Larsons, who own and operate Telescope Media Group, use their unique skills to identify and tell compelling stories through video, including commercials, short films, and live event productions. They exercise creative control over the videos they produce and make editorial judgments about what events to take on, what video content to use, what audio content to use, what text to use, the order in which to present content, and whether to use voiceovers. The Larsons gladly work with all people, regardless of race, sexual orientation, sex, religious belief, or other classification. But because they are Christians who believe that God has called them to use their talents and their company to honor God, the Larsons decline any requests for their services that conflict with their religious beliefs. This includes any that, in their view, contradict biblical truth, promote sexual immorality, support the destruction of unborn children, promote racism or racial division, incite violence, degrade women, or promote any conception of marriage other than as a lifelong institution between one man and one woman. The Larsons now wish to make films that promote their view of marriage as a sacrificial covenant between one man and one woman. To do so, they want to begin producing wedding videos, but only of opposite-sex weddings. According to the Larsons, these videos will capture the background stories of couples' loves leading to commitment, the couple's joy, the sacredness of their sacrificial vows at the altar, and even following chapters of the couple's lives. The Larsons believe that the videos, which they intend to post and share online, which will allow them to read a broader audience to achieve maximal cultural impact and affect the cultural narrative regarding marriage. Minnesota has a different idea. Relying on two provisions of the Minnesota Human Rights Acts, it claims that a decision to produce any wedding video requires the Larsons to make them for everyone, regardless of the Larsons' beliefs and the message they wish to convey. The pr first provision states, It is an unfair discriminatory practice to deny any person the full and equal enjoyment of the goods, services, facilities, privileges, advantages, and accommodations of a place of public accommodation because of sexual orientation. The second provides, it is an unfair discriminatory practice for a person engaged in a trade or a business or the provision of a service to intentionally refuse to do business with, refuse to contract with, or discriminate in basic terms, conditions, or performance of the contract because of a person's sexual orientation unless the alleged refusal or discrimination is because of a legitimate business purpose. Minnesota reads these two provisions as requiring the Larsons to produce both opposite-sex and same-sex wedding videos, or none at all. According to Minnesota, the Larsons' duty does not end there. As the Larsons enter the wedding, wedding video business, their videos must depict same- and opposite-sex weddings in an equally positive light. If they do not, Minnesota has made clear the Larsons will have unlawfully discriminated against protective, prospective customers because of sexual orientation. The Larsons have sued Minnesota in federal district court seeking injunctive relief preventing, preventing Minnesota from enforcing the MHRA challenge against them. Their principal theory is that it's unconstitutional under the free speech clause of the First Amendment to require them to make same-sex wedding videos. They also raise free exercise, associational freedom, freedom to associate, equal protection, and unconstitutional conditions claims as well as an argument that the law is unconstitutionally vague. At this juncture, all that is before us are the allegations of the Larson's complaint. Early on, the district court granted Minnesota's motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim, presumably because it was arguably premature because there had been no lawsuit yet, or no threat yet. It also denied Larson's request for preliminary injunction, but only because it also decided to dismiss the lawsuit. According to the court, the Larson's free speech claim failed as a matter of law because the statute serves an important governmental interest, preventing discrimination, without limiting more speech than is necessary to accomplish the goal. So basically, the court is essentially making some sort of intermediate or even strict scrutiny analysis, essentially. It also ruled that the statute did not violate any of the other constitutional rights identified by the Larson's. Before addressing the merits, we must first decide whether they're standing. 
That's a very good point. You must always have standing. And that is something that immediately occurred to me is like, is there enough of a threat here? Or is this is this a premature lawsuit? Um, because the Larsons are the ones suing. So, you know, everything they're talking about is speculative. So is it is there concrete injury enough to file a lawsuit? This is almost a facial challenge rather than an as applied challenge because it isn't being applied to anything. So this is a facial challenge basically saying the law as written is facially basically saying in every possible context unconstitutional. Um, so it's both facial challenge and premature potentially. Let's see what the court says. To have standing, the Larsons must establish injury in fact, a casual connection between injury and the challenge law, and that a favorable decision is likely to redress the injury. There's no doubt that the Larson's allegations satisfy the second and third requirements. Any injury would be challenged, would be traceable to the statute and would be redressed by a judicial decision. The only real question is whether they've suffered an injury in fact, because it's speculative. Although a harm must be actual or imminent, not conjectural or hypothetical, to constitute an injury in fact, a plaintiff need not wait for actual prosecution or enforcement before challenging a law constitutionality. In fact, all plaintiff must do at the motion to dismiss stage is allege an intention to engage in a course of conduct arguably affected with constitutional interests but prescribed by a statute and thereby exists a credible threat of prosecution. The Larson's constitutional claims meet the test. The free speech clause of the First Amendment covers films. So the videos that Larson's intend to make are affected with a constitutional interest. The Larson's desire to engage in a course of conduct that includes production of videos means their claims are affected with constitutional interest regardless of the precise legal theory. Moreover, the Larson's have adequately alleged a credible threat of enforcement. If the Larson's enter the wedding video business and refuse to film same-sex weddings, Minnesota has made clear it will view their actions as violations of the statute. Indeed, Minnesota has publicly announced the statute requires all private businesses, including videographers, to provide equal services for same and opposite sex weddings. It has even employed testers to target non-compliant businesses and has already pursued sexual, successful enforcement actions against a wedding, ven wedding vendor who refused to rent a wedding venue for a same-sex wedding. Minnesota's active enforcement of the statute leaves us little doubt the Larsons will face legal consequences if they decide to start making wedding videos. So it is uh, partially amusing to me that Minnesota has hired people to, to test this. So you'll see this a lot in, for example, um, uh, businesses in terms of serving alcohol. They'll send in people under the age of 21 to see if the business will serve them or not. I just find it a little bit funny that they're hiring people to say, you know, to see see whether or not they'll film a wedding that doesn't really exist. But okay. Having determined the Larsons have standing, we now address their principal claim, which is that the wedding videos are speech and they have a First Amendment right to make them only for opposite sex weddings. At this stage, our task is to review the complaint de novo that is fresh to determine whether it alleges one or more actionable claims, which is right because there are no factual, there's no facts yet because it was dismissed. So everything is an allegation. So everything has to be de novo. There's no alternative, right? The First Amendment, which applies to states through the 14th Amendment, prohibits laws abridging freedom of speech. It promotes the free exchange of ideas by allowing people to speak in many forms and conveys a variety of messages, including those that invite dispute and are provocative and challenging. It also prevents the government from compelling individuals to mouth support for views they find objectionable. As the Supreme Court has made clear, there is no room under our Constitution for a more restrictive approach because the alternative would lead to standardization of ideas by legislatures, courts, or dominant political groups or community groups. And I was saying this yesterday in my sort of tongue-in-cheek stream about um, Ken White's article because, yeah, exactly. There's no room for a more restrictive standard because if you do, well, you're basically doomed. And so the court's saying that and they're completely right to say it. The Larson's video are a form of speech that's entitled to First Amendment protection. The Supreme Court long ago recognized that expressions by means of motion pictures is included within the free speech and free press guarantee of the First and Fourteenth Amendments. Indeed, it cannot be doubted that motion pictures are a significant medium for the communication of ideas. For example, this motion picture, the one I'm making before you 
right now, this is a video in which I'm expressing ideas. So I'd like to think that freedom of speech is implicated in what I'm doing literally at this moment, communicating to you through video. So that's nice to know that that's protected, right? Although the Larsons do not plan to make feature films, the videos they do wish to produce will convey a message designed to affect public attitudes and behavior. I'm not sure how making a feature film is relevant one way or another, but whatever. According to their complaint, they will tell of healthy stories of sacrificial love and commitment between man and woman, depicting marriage as a divinely ordained covenant, and oppose current cultural narratives about marriage which with the Larsons disagree. By design, they will serve to be a medium for communications of ideas about marriage. See, for example, Masterpiece Cake Shop, which we talked about earlier. And like creators of other types of films, such as documentaries, the Larsons will exercise substantial editorial control and judgment, including making decisions about footage and dialogue to include the order in which to present content and whether to set parts of the film to music. The videos are, in a word, speech. The dissent reaches the opposite conclusion, a dissent which I'm looking forward to reading. The dissent truly says the videos are not speech. I, I look forward to reading that and understanding how that could be true. The video dis reaches the dissent reaches the opposite conclusion, but only by recasting or ignoring the allegations in the complaint, which is at this stage we must accept as true. 100% true. It's on a motion to dismiss. Therefore, we have to assume everything they're saying is true. That's the whole point. You only dismiss if they don't have a legal claim, so you have to assume everything they're saying is true. The complaint makes clear that Larson's videos will not just be simple recordings, the product of planned video camera at the end of an aisle and pressing recording, where they intend to shoot, assemble, and edit the videos with the goal of expressing their own views of the sanctity of marriage. Even if customers may have some say over the finished product, the complaint itself is clear that Larson's retain ultimate editorial control and judgment. It also does not make a difference that the Larsons are expressing their views through a for-profit enterprise. And I think that's a very good thing, because if it did, for-profit institutions, such as, say, for example, the New York Times or CNN or insert any other sort of major media group, which are all for-profit, uh, would not have First Amendment rights. And that would be kind of a bizarre conclusion, right? In fact, in holding that motion pictures are protected by the First Amendment, the Supreme Court explicitly rejected the idea that films do not fall within the First Amendment agus simply because they're often produced by large-scale businesses conducted for private profit. This court has repeatedly rejected the notion that a speaker's profit motive gives the government a freer hand in compelling speech. Other commercial and corporate entities, including utility companies and newspapers, have received First Amendment protections too. The reason the court has said is that they contribute to the discussion, debate, and dissemination of information and ideas the First Amendment seeks to foster no less than individuals do. Yeah, fair enough. Minnesota's position is that regulating the Larson's conduct, not their speech. To be sure, producing a video requires several actions that individually might be mere conduct. Positioning a camera, setting up microphones, clicking and dragging files on the computer screen. But what matters for our analysis is that these activities together come to produce finished videos that are media for the communication of ideas. And I would tend to agree. That would be like saying that freedom of the press in terms of like an actual physical newspaper is not a First Amendment issue because all you're doing is, and we'll make this old school, so before computers, um, all you're doing is, um, you know, assembling things on a physical layout and inking keys and pressing them on paper and so forth and so on. You know, every step of that is action, but the ultimate result, of course, is speech. So breaking it down into his actions to say it's not speech would be a pretty weird consequence. If we were to accept Minnesota's invitation to evaluate each of Larson's acts individually, wide swaths of protected speech would be subject to regulation by the government. Government could argue, for example, that painting is not speech because it involves the physical movements of a brush, or claim that newspapers conduct because it depends on mechanical operation of the printing press. Isn't it funny that me and the court came up with literally the same example? As I said, I didn't read this case beforehand. I wanted to share my thoughts with you before live, but I literally just came up with the exact same example the court did because we it's exactly the same thing. So, hey, I guess I'll give myself a point for coming up with the same uh, argument the court did. 
It could even declare a parade as conduct because it involves walking. Yet there's no question the government cannot compel an artist to paint, demand editors of a newspaper publish a response piece, or require organizers of a parade to allow everyone to participate. Speech is not conduct just because the government says it is. Yeah. Minnesota's interpretation of the statute interferes with speech in two overlapping ways. First, it compels the Larsons to speak favorably about same-sex marriage if it chooses to speak favorably about opposite-sex marriage. Second, it operates as a content-based regulation of the speech. The Supreme Court has said time and again that freedom of speech includes both the right to speak freely and the right to refrain from speaking at all. Yeah, freedom of speech does mean you have the right to not speak too, which is also a good right. The choice of the speaker not to propound a particular point of view is presumed to lie beyond the power of the government to control. Yeah. Oh, and I, don't, I shouldn't have skipped over this line, actually. As Janice recognized, the latter is perhaps the more sacred of the rights. Yeah. So if you're choosing actually between the right to speak freely and the right not to speak, the courts tend to suggest that the second is actually more important. So your ability to speak what your mind is in the mind of the court less important than your right not to be compelled to give speech. And I, I think it's probably correct. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of potential reasons that we might want to restrict speech, as we were discussing yesterday. But to force you to say words you don't want to say is a whole nother ballgame. You know, to to put into your mouth words you despise, I, I think is is rightly considered a whole nother ballgame and for and for just reasons. To apply the statute to the Larsons in the manner Minnesota threatens is at odds with the cardinal constitutional command against compelled speech. I do like cardinal in the same sense of like Catholic sin. It's a cardinal sin. It's basically that category. Yeah, this is this is this is bad stuff. The Larsons do not want to make videos celebrating same-sex marriage, which with they find objectionable. Instead, they wish to actively promote opposite-sex weddings through the videos, which will, at a minimum, convey a different message than those videos the statute would require them to make. Even if the desire to speak selectively is provocative and stirs people to anger, Minnesota cannot coerce them into betraying their convictions and promoting ideas they find objectionable. Compelling speech in this manner, as the Supreme Court has made clear, is always demeaning. This is especially true as here because Minnesota insists the Larsons must be willing to convey the same positive message in their videos about same-sex marriage as they do for opposite-sex marriage. You know, I am as offended as the majority is in this case, and for basically the same reasons. To me, this is like, this is ridiculous. You can't make people say what they want. And also... It goes to the individual person and their ideas. So sometimes in cases like this, I'll see where someone will say, "Well, they're not—they're uh, picking and choosing their religious beliefs. You know, they're not—they're not following the Bible, you know, strictly because of this commandment, that commandment. They're not following." But the courts can't look at that. The, re the, the religious beliefs are as you state them. You know, you're—you're you're entitled to whatever religious beliefs, and the degree to which they do or do not follow the Bible is totally your call. Um, the courts don't. Go, don't and can't get into that. Um, so even if like 99 out of 100 Christians would say that's not Christianity, if it is to you, that's your belief system. And courts don't get into that. They can't. Everyone's entitled to freedom of religion, right? Minnesota attempts to downplay this injury by pointing out the statute would not require the Larsons to convey any specific message in their videos. Even if the Larsons must be willing to produce positive videos, Minnesota argues they need not actually do so until a customer requests a film with this point of view. Uh, that's a very, very strange argument. Um, because that sort of suggests the possibility that it, it is that there that it's possible that a same-sex couple would come in and want their marriage to be filmed, but not in a positive way. I, I'm not really saying that particular hypothetical. P put it into a positive light is kind of implicit in the nature of the media, nature of the thing you're doing, right? I guess there is some like wedding that could want to do it as some sort of like tragic comma horror thing, sort of a humorous thing, but let's just say that's not your average uh, wedding, I'm sure. Even aside from the implausibility, for it seems unlikely that any same-sex couple would request a video condemning their marriage, 
What do you have? This argument does not get Minnesota far under the First Amendment doctrine. The Supreme Court has recognized that the government still compels speech when it passes a law that has the effect of foisting a third-party message on the speaker. In a prior case, for example, it held that Massachusetts could not use its public accommodation law to require sponsors of private parades to include a group of gay, lesbian, and bisexual individuals who wish to march with them while carrying their own banner. The court explained that compelling the inclusion of otherwise impermissibly declared the sponsor's speech itself to be a public accommodation in a way that altered the expressive conduct of the parade. Yeah. And you've seen this from time to time where there will be like, you know, an Irish Irish uh, parade and the, the, the some sort of gay uh, Irish people want to have a float and they say no. And you can do that because it's your parade. You can choose who to have in it and not, depending on whatever rules you like. It's your parade. It's your party and you can have it any way you want. Similarly, in a prior case, the Supreme Court held a Florida statute that required newspapers that published attacks on personal characters of official record of political candidates to publish the responses to free of cost. Forced inclusion, the court reached, reason failed to clear the barriers of the First Amendment because it impermissibly intrude into the function of the editor. The lesson from the prior case is that the First Amendment is relevant when the government compels speech, regardless of who is writing the script. Yeah. The statute also operates in this case as a content-based regulation of the speech, even if, as the Supreme Court has recognized, the statute does not, on its face, aim at the suppression of speech. A content-based regulation mandates speech that a speaker would not otherwise make or exacts a penalty on the basis of the content of the speech. By treating the choice to talk about one topic, opposite-sex marriages, as triggering for them to talk about a topic they'd rather avoid, same-sex marriages, the statute does both at once. In fact, by requiring the, stat the Larsons to convey a positive message about same-sex weddings, it goes even further. The Supreme Court's decision in Tornillo highlights the problems with content-based regulations. Even if a regulation that requires speech does not directly prevent the speaker speakers from saying anything they wished, it still exacts a penalty. In Tornillo, the penalty threatened to drive editors to conclude the safe course was to avoid controversy and to simply not publish news or commentary arguably within the reach of the statute. Here, the safe course for the Larsons would be to avoid the wedding video business altogether. Yet this type of self-censorship, a byproduct of regulating speech on conduct unquestionably dampers the vigor and limits of the public debate. Yep. Laws that compel speech or regulate it based on content are subject to strict scrutiny. Yes, it is. Yes, content-based regulations are pretty much the quintessential definition of strict scrutiny. Which will require Minnesota, at a minimum, to prove the application of the statute to the Larsons is narrowly tailored to serve a compelling state interest. The fundamental rule of protection under the First Amendment is that a speaker has autonomy to choose his own message. In an as-applied challenge like this one, okay, so they're calling it an as-applied challenge, but I'd say it's a facial challenge, but that's fine. In an as-applied challenge like this one, the focus of the strict scrutiny test is on the actual speech being regulated rather than on how the law might affect others who are not before the court. Okay. So it's like a theoretical as applied challenge. Sure, why not? It's I don't I'm not really familiar with this concept, but sure, fine. The state asserts an interest in ensuring that all people in Minnesota are entitled to full and equal enjoyment of public accommodation and services. This interest has substantial constitutional pedigree, and generally speaking, we have no doubt is compelling. For example, the Supreme Court has said anti-discrimination laws are well within the state's power to enact when the legislature has reason to believe a given group is target of discrimination. Indeed, the statute itself has withstood a constitutional challenge after Minnesota applied it to compel a large and basically unselective social class club to accept female members. Okay. And like the dissent, we have little doubt that Minnesota has powerful reasons for extending the statute to protect its citizens against sexual orientation discrimination. But that is not the point. Even anti-discrimination laws, as critically important as they are, must yield to the Constitution. Yeah, the Constitution beats all. That's the point. 
And as compelling as the interest of preventing discriminatory conduct may be, speech is treated differently under the First Amendment. While a law is free to promote all sorts of conduct in the place of harmful behavior, it is not free to interfere with speech for no better reason than promoting an approved message or discouraging a disfavored one, however enlightened either purpose may strike the government. As the Supreme Court has explained, even if the government may prohibit the act of discriminating against individuals in the provision of publicly available goods, privileges, and services, it may not declare another speech itself to be a public accommodation or to grant protected individuals the right to participate in another speech. Hurley is particularly instructive. Oh, there's a question. So I have to raise a question. Will this case be handled the same way if refusal is based on firmly held religious belief discriminating against another productive group, for example, race? Well, that's a very reasonable question. And the, the cases on point have suggested that race is different. Um, so if, if that was the issue, then the analysis might be different because race, race is treated differently. So you would have to make an argument as to like why it's like a genuinely held speech or genuinely held religious belief. Um, and that would be, it's, it's a tougher argument. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's very likely it might come out the other way because, um, you know, 13th, 14th and 15th amendments, for example, were enacted on the basis of race. You know, they're, they're based on, based on slavery, based on discrimination against issues of race. So race has been treated differently by the Constitution. You know, 13th Amendment bans slavery, 14th Amendment pr makes equal protection, and 15th Amendment gives voting rights on the basis of race. So race has a special class uh, of protection unto itself. So how that would interfere with uh, or interact with uh, this would be um, an interesting issue. Another issue where race is treated differently is in the issue of um, in the issue of how juries um, think about things. So normally how a jury makes a decision in a criminal case, you don't go into what the jury did or did not say. Uh, until very recently, one of the very few reasons you could crack that is for racial reasons. So if you could prove the jury like argued amongst themselves they should punish this guy harder because of race, that's considered an improper thing for the jury to argue about. And... Um, I think recently maybe sexual orientation was also brought into that, but I don't remember how that came out. But I know that race is one of those few bases because race is treated as, as different because of this United States history. So if this was a racial couple, it would be a much different argument. I don't know how it would come out. You'd have, to, you'd have to at least make the argument that it's your genuine bona fide religious belief that you know, black people shouldn't be married to each other, which seems like an odd belief. Uh, but yeah, it would be a different argument. Race is, race is special. Hurley is particularly instructive. When Massachusetts forced the organizers of a private parade to include a group that wished to march in the parade as a way to express pride in Irish heritage as openly gay, lesbian, or bisexual individuals, the Supreme Court concluded that applying the state's public accommodation law in this way violated the freedom of speech. Although anti-discrimination laws are generally constitutional, the court reasoned a peculiar application that required speakers to, ex to alert their expressive conduct was not. In short, the court drew the line exactly the word Larry Larson's asked us to here, to prevent the government from requiring their speech to serve as public accommodation for others. Similarly, in Dale, the Supreme Court held that the Boy Scouts had a right to expel a gay rights activist despite the New Jersey anti-discrimination law that prohibited it. The reason, the court said, was that the Boy Scouts' opposition to homosexuality was expressive and forced the inclusion of the activist would have significantly affected its expression. As, this case, as these cases dem demonstrate, regulating speech because of Regular speech because of its discriminatory or offensive conduct is not a compelling state interest, however hurtful it may be. It is a bedrock principle that the government may not prohibit the expression of an idea simply because society finds the ideal expensive, expressive, or disagreeable. After all, Westboro Baptist Church could carry, car carry highly inflammatory signs at military funerals, the Nazis could march in areas heavily populated by Jewish residents, and activists could burn the American flag as a form of protest. 
Yeah, the Nazis, the Nazi March one is a really interesting uh, case uh, in Stokey, Skokie, uh, because the ACLU, the ACLU went to bat for the Nazis. The, the Nazis were prohibited from marching in this heavily Jewish neighborhood, and the ACLU sued on behalf of the Nazis, saying the Nazis had the right to march. So, yeah, good for the ACLU, because, you know, that, that was a tough position. They lost a lot of members, lost a lot of members over that, uh, that case, but... As they rightly point out, freedom of speech protects everyone, including the Nazis. Uh, question is, would it be reasonable to say that element weighing in this is lack of enumerated protection in 14 for sexuality? Um, I, I, I think, I don't know that's the issue as such. I, th I think it's, it's not the issue of the enumeration as well. When you're interpreting any provision of law, when you're interpreting any provision of law, there's many different ways to interpret law. Uh, you can look to the text, history, intent, purpose, policy, and there I think there's one other, and precedent is the other one. And so when you're looking to the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment and interpreting it, one of the things you can look to is the history. And what do we mean by history? Well, the history of how it came about and why it came about. And, and basically the history is, is slavery. That is the thing they're trying to solve, is slavery. So the entire context of 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, uh, both in its text and its historic, historical application, is based on racism and based on slavery. It's designed to fix that problem. It's a response to the Civil War. So the it's not so much the enumerated issue as the history of it strongly suggests a particular application as specific to race. That was a problem designed to solve. Um, interracial, yeah, exactly the same issue. Should, yeah, so it would be the same analysis. Like if you had a strong belief against it, yeah, it's a different. It's different because of race. It's a different analysis, and I don't know which way it comes. Um, but at least, at least for me, and this is just me speaking, I would, I would say that they should have the right to discriminate, just, just because I believe freedom of speech is, is a, is a paramount value. Uh, I believe it kind of beats everything, and you know, it's, it's tough because. You know, if it's the only like providers, then there's there's issues. But I, I think freedom of speech beats all. But it, it would be a different it would be a different analysis for sure. Um, yeah. The cases relied upon by Minnesota and the dissent are not to the contrary. In Roberts, for example, the Supreme Court emphasized an all-male social club had failed to show a law requiring the admission of female members imposed any serious burden on male membership freedom of association or impeded the organization's ability to engage in protected avenues or disseminate its preferred views. Yeah, Nexu, uh, you that's exactly... That's exactly right. And that goes back to the famous quote from Whitney v. California as well. Um, if there be time through the processes of democracy, the cure for bad speech is more speech, not enforced silence. So, yeah, you should let the Nazis march for the exact reason that the anti-Nazis can then give their march and do their fundraiser and also give their counter speech. And, you know, you can hear what they have to say and you may be able to convince some people that being Nazis is not such a great idea, you know, because they have, you know, I, I don't know for certain, but I would imagine that some of the people who went to Charlottesville, for example, may have reconsidered their position since. And one of the abilities of free speech is allowing people to say foolish things in the hope that they will learn of their foolishness. Um, so it's also a service to them and, and to society as a whole because it allows us to know that this kind of speech is out there, you know, otherwise, you know, um, to ignorance is bliss, as they say, you know, if we were truly able to oppress this speech, we might not realize that it's really simmering under the, under the, the surface. And so I think sunlight is the best disinfectant is a pretty good argument. Um, it allows people to confront it and confront the people and, you know, maybe have an interesting discussion. If Minnesota were correct, there's no reason that it would have to stop with the Larsons. In theory, it could require the statute to require a Muslim tattoo artist to inscribe, my religion is the only true religion on the body of a Christian, if he or she would do the same for a fellow Muslim, or could demand an atheist magician perform an evangelical church service. 
fact, Minnesota were to do what other jurisdictions have done and declared political affiliation or ideology to be protected, it could force a Democratic speechwriter to afford the same services to a Republican, or it could require a professional entertainer to perform at rallies for both Republican and Democratic candidates for the same office. Yeah, these are the kind of consequences that might, might ensue. And some people might say this is parade of horribles. Some people may say this is, um, um, you know, just a, a appeal to uh, ridiculousness, appeal to uh, absurdity. Some people might say it's slippery slope. But to my mind, this is all legitimate. It's basically saying, look, if you accept this principle, here's a whole bunch of things that flow from that principle. If you apply it in these other characteristics, it's, it's my view, proper thinking. And it's like, if, if this is true, what else is true is always a good thing to do in law. If this is true, what else is true? Always helpful. Even so, Minnesota argues that we should apply intermediate scrutiny based on a theory that, once again, turns on the distinction between conduct and speech, specifically when speech and non-speech elements are combined in the same course of conduct and the government seeks to regulate the non-speech element, intermediate scrutiny applies under the incidental burden doctrine. Right. So if you if both are combined and you're trying to regulate the non-speech elements, then intermediate scrutiny applies. That seems perfectly reasonable, you know, because um, you're not targeting the speech and it's incidental to what you're trying to do, but still because you're burdening speech, intermediate scrutiny. Seems reasonable. According to Minnesota, the statute only incidentally burns speech because it neutrally regulates commercial conduct and economic activity and requires larcens to do nothing more than to provide services to customers regardless of sexual orientation. Well, when the services in question are speech, that's a little different, isn't it? The problem with this theory, even aside from the fact the statute is not content neutral, see, um, a, see Supra uh, below, Supra's above, I forget. <laughs> this missive does not actually seek to regulate non-speech activity. The commercial conduct and economic activity to which Minnesota refers is the making of the videos themselves, which, as we've already explained, is speech. Yeah. Minnesota cannot specifically identify anything else, meaning it is just repackaging this theory that the videos are not speech. Importantly, the fact that Minnesota is not shy about its belief that it can regulate videos themselves distinguishes this case from other applications of the law that actually do target conduct which are generally constitutional even when they incidentally affect speech. An employment discrimination law, for example, can unquestionably require an employee to take down a sign reading white applicants only. And a, pro, a public accommodation law requiring a restaurant to serve people of all races, genders, and sexual orientations will have an incidental effect of requiring servicers to speak to take the order. But these consequences are incidental because the relevant law is targeting the activities of hiring employees and providing food, neither of which typically in constitute speech here by contrast the targeting speech itself right so normally you're just targeting things that don't in and of themselves implicitly involve speech the, no the normal concept of i want to hire an employee doesn't normally like in its general sense con uh, imply speech you know because there are a whole bunch of tasks that don't imply speech now it could in a specific conduct context imply speech you know if it's a religious-based institution doing hiring for religious reasons first amendment would trigger but you know, generally, hiring employees isn't going to do it. And normally, serving food isn't going to do it. There's normally not a First Amendment interest here. But here we're talking about making videos. It's kind of the First Amendment interest in question. It's not like your operating hours. It's the fundamental core of what you're doing. Minnesota also suggests a lesser form of scrutiny is appropriate because the Larsons can say they disapprove of same-sex marriage in some other way. But because, just like New Hampshire could not require drivers to display the state motto, live free or die on their license plates, even if they could disavow through the motto through a conspicuous bumper sticker, to do so would disclaim here would be inadequate. The reason is the constitutional protection of speakers' freedom would be empty if the government could require speakers to affirm in one breath that which would deny in the next. Yeah, fair enough. To be sure, the Supreme Court has suggested that the opportunity to provide a disclaimer can make a difference when the law requires an otherwise silent party to provide a forum for the speech of others. One example is Prime Prune Yard Shipping Center, which required a, which upheld a requirement compelling the owner of a shopping mall to allow private individuals to, disp to distribute public pa private political pamphlets on the premises. Ugh, that was a bit of a tongue twister. 
The court emphasized the owner could expressly disavow any connection with the message simply by posting signs in the area where the speakers or hand billers stood. Noticeably absent, however, was any concern that access to the mall might affect the shopping center's own exercise of the right to speak or any allegations the owner objected to the content of the pamphlets. Here, of course, Larson strenuously object to what Minnesota would have them say. And I don't know enough about the underlying case to comment because the idea of allowing a mall, forcing a mall to allow people to distribute pamphlets is a bit odd. Um, but So I don't, I'm not familiar with the underlying case. Minnesota's reliance on FAIR is similarly fault. FAIR was also about the forum, but this time for legal recruiters. Law schools, which invited and hosted recruiters of all types, objected to hosting the military because of a disagreement with the policies that excluded gays and lesbians from serving. Federal law, however, requires schools to give equal access to military recruiters or lose federal funding. A school sued, claiming that they had a First Amendment right to exclude military recruiters from campus. The Supreme Court disagreed, even if the schools had to send emails and post notices on the behalf of both elements of speech. The Supreme Court upheld the law because it did not interfere with the law school's expression or co-opt the speech. Simply hosting recruiters was not speech. That makes sense. Simply hosting them is not speech. Okay. According to the court. So the accommodation of the military recruiter's message did not sufficiently interfere with any message in the school. Besides, just like the mall owner in the Prune Yards case, the school remained free to express whatever views they had on the military congressionally mandated employment policies. Cases like Hurley, by contrast, involved unconstitutionally compelled speech because the complaining speaker's own message was affected by the speech it was forced to accommodate. Okay. And incidentally, lest I need to uh, point this out, of course, military policy has since changed. Gays and lesbians can now, of course, join the military. These are older cases that they're talking about. The facts of the cases pleaded by the Larsons are much closer to Hurley than Pruneyard or Fair. Rather than serving as a forum for the speech of others, Larson's video will carry their own message. The statute interferes with the message by requiring, requiring them to say something they otherwise would not. Larson's then lose autonomy to choose the content of the message, which violates the cardinal constitutional command. Yep. Consistent with, and then we have the three, uh, little three dot thing, just bas basically uh, indicates a separation of thought, which I kind of like. It's... Uh, Nice little linguistic tip. And it usually says you're getting to the very end. It's just like a break of, break of logic. Consistent with the Supreme Court's instruction that anti-discrimination laws do not, as a general matter, violate the First Amendment, our holding leaves intact other applications of the statute that do not regulate speech based on conduct or otherwise compel an individual to speak. But when, as here, Minnesota seeks to regulate speech itself as public accommodation, it has gone too far and its interests must give way to the demands of the First Amendment. The district court also ruled that Larson's could not seek relief on various other constitutional theories. We largely agree these claims fail, but one, the free exercise claim, can proceed because it's intertwined with a free speech claim. Accordingly, the, accordingly, the Larson's are free to pursue their so-called hybrid rights claim on demand. Yeah, so the, the freedom of religion argument and the freedom of speech argument are two different arguments, and they have two different sets of constitutional lines, and they can theoretically come out two different ways, so fair enough. The freedom of speech argument is better than the freedom of religion argument here, in my view. But why not plead both? The basic premise of the Larson's free exercise claim is the statute, as interpreted by Minnesota, prevents them from fully exercising their religious belief. It does so because they will have to show support for same-sex marriage, even though they object to it on religious grounds or refrain from making wedding with vetting views at all. This is not a typical free exercise claim. Yeah, it's not. Fair enough. Those seeking relief under the free exercise clause of the First Amendment will ordinarily argue that religion requires them to engage in conduct the government forbids or to forbid certain conduct the government requires. If the Larson's claim fell into one of these two categories, then we'd simply apply the rule that neutral, generally applicable laws that incidentally burden and particularly religious practice do not have to be justified by a compelling governmental interest. Yeah, so as a general proposition, if there's a law that's generally applicable, then it doesn't have to be justified by a governmental interest. However, see the Freedom of Restoration Act, which has modified this substantially.
But Larson's have alleged that the statute burns their religiously motivated speech, not conduct. So the claim falls into a class of hybrid situations in which the free exercise clause in connection with other constitutional protections, such as freedom of speech, can bar application of a neutral, generally applicable law. Because the Larson's freedom of exercise claim is connected with their communicative activities, the Larson's may use their free exercise concerns to reinforce the free speech claim. Yeah, it's basically the, what the court is saying, and I think is right here, is it's basically not really an argument unto itself. It's basically an argument in support of the free speech claim, which I think is probably the right answer. Minnesota, the district court, and the dissent seem to think that we can simply ignore the hybrid rights distinction from Smith because it was dicta. Dicta is basically when a court says something that is not strictly necessary for the case to be decided. So if a court says something just like kind of off the cuff, then it's dicta. And what is and is not dicta can get kind of complicated. But you know, if they just say something like, oh, by the way, um, then it's not really binding. For two reasons, this cannot be applied here. First, we apply the hybrid rights doctrine post Smith in a different case, which rejected the church standalone free exercise claim, but recognized the church's other constitutional claim breathed light back into the hybrid rights claim. Because of this aspect of the cornerstone Bible church resurrected a claim that had been left for dead by the district court, our application of hybrid rights theory was part of the holding because it was essential to the judgment of the case. Second, we do not agree with the premise that Smith's analysis of the hybrid rights claim was dicta. Smith's upheld a generally applicable law that interfered with the sacramental use of peyote. To reach this conclusion, however, the Supreme Court had to grapple with a long line of cases that had treated free exercise clause as a shield against laws burning religious practices. Rather than overrule this decision, the court explained that these involved a hybrid situation in which the free exercise challenge was intertwined with another constitutional right. That means Smith did more than simply speculate about how to treat a hybrid claim in some sort of hypothetical future case, but had to describe the operation of an existing doctrine, one that then applied to the parties. Although the claimants did not prevail under the hybrid right doctrine in Smith, the court decision of it was far from dicta. Yeah, that makes sense. So the court is basically saying, here's a whole bunch of analysis that explains the law. This party doesn't win, but that's still a valid exploration of law. Fair enough. Of course, it's not at all clear the hybrid's right doctrine will make any real difference in the end. In this commentator opinion, it almost certainly won't. After all, the Larson's free speech claim already requires application of strict scrutiny. As a practical matter, then, the fact the videos also have religious significance may not move the needle much. Yep. But because the Larson's have adequately alleged the hybrid rights claim, the district court must allow them to develop it on remand. Fair enough. The Larsons cannot prevail on any of the remaining claims, beginning with their allegation the statute of violates their associational freedom rights, freedom to associate. Their theory is the law forces them to join together and speak with those who wish to express opposite messages about marriage, which unconstitutionally impairs their ability to express views and only their views. Although the Larsons call it associational freedom, this is really a disguised free speech claim. A absolutely true. The right to expressive association protects groups from being forced to accept members they do not desire. But requiring the Larsons to produce same-sex wedding videos would not force them to accept same-sex couples as members of their company or some other group to which they belong. Exactly right. Rather, they'd simply have to associate with the same-sex couples in the, same, in the sense they'd have to interact with them. Staying alone, these interactions will not uh, affect their ability to advocate public or private viewpoints. It's only when these interactions require the Larsons to speak in certain ways that impairs their ability to express their views. Indeed, the Larson's allegations all but doom their associational freedom claim. The complaint stresses that the Larson's gladly will work with all people, regardless of sexual orientation, as long as the message of any video they are asked to make fits with the belief. Larson's counsel reinforced this point at oral argument, explaining they have no problem making other types of videos for gay or lesbian customers. It's clear then that serving to, speaking to, and otherwise associating with these customers is not the harm they seek to ratify. Absolutely true. The real objection is the message. Yep. The Larsons have also brought a claim alleging violation of equal protection. Their argument begins with the uncontroversial premise that free speech and free exercise of religion are fundamental constitutional rights. Yes, they are. The statute treats people differently in the exercise of these fundamental rights, they say, because filmmakers who support same-sex marriage are free to create weddings of videos of those who align with their views of marriage, while those who oppose it are not. So this classification affects fundamental rights 
matter of strict scrutiny, the standard of the statute cannot satisfy. The problem with the logic lies in the middle step, the classification that they believe they identified. The statute does not classify anyone based on their views about marriage. Rather, under, mis- rather under the interpretation, every business must be willing to film both. In other words, the law applies equally, and that is 100% true. 100% true. It applies to everyone equally. Absolutely true. To be sure, the Larsons and others like them are unhappy with the statute's requirement, but this dissatisfaction with the law is not itself a classification. Indeed, by the Larsons' logic, any rule that affects religiously modified conduct will be subject to strict scrutiny because it would create two groups of people, those who are happy with the law and those who are not. But we know from Smith that the government has the power to enact neutrally generally applicable laws. We accordingly reject the attempt to manufacture a legal classification where it does not exist. Yep. The Larsons further allege the statute is vague and allows unbridled discretion. They focus on the statute which forbids discrimination unless the alleged refusal is because of a legitimate business purpose. According to the Larsons, this exception creates uncertainty about the scope of the law. Not even close. Not even close. I'm going to try, though. I'd argue it as a lawyer. I'd argue it as a lawyer. I just know I'm going to lose it. The statute as applies to Larson's is not unconstitutionally vague. We consider whether the statute is vague as applies to particular facts at issue. For a plaintiff who engages in some conduct that is clearly prescribed cannot complain of the vagueness as it applies to the conduct of others. Yes, whether it would be vague in some circumstance doesn't mean whether or not it's vague in this circumstance. Great. The allegations in the complaint once again doom the argument this time because they insist the statute prohibits them from creating only opposite-sex wedding videos, and the Minnesota has categorically declared the religious objections are not a legitimate business purpose. So the argument that they're left in legal limbo rings hollow. Yeah, it's like you can't have both at the same time. Although maybe this was intended as a backup argument, it's basically like if not one, then the other, in which case this was brilliant legal strategy, just in case that they lose on the one, they can gain on the other. So maybe that was the intent, in which case, brilliant legal strategy by their lawyer. It's like, you know you're going to lose one of them, but make both. I buy it. And you don't know which one the the appellate court is going to argue, so you have to argue both at appeal, too, even though you know you're going to lose one. Yeah. Fortunately, the, the Code of Federal Regulations and the, um, the, 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 the Federal Regulations for Civil Procedure make absolutely clear that a lawyer can, in fact, argue mutually inconsistent arguments. So you can absolutely argue two mutually inconsistent things at the same time. So that's a good thing. The Larsons also cannot explain how legitimate business purpose exception gives unbridled discretion. Larsons fail to cite even a single example of discrimination in enforcement of the exception, much less show that Minnesota has a pattern of discrimination in its enforcement. That would be like a selective prosecution argument, and that's weak. Nor is the phrase legitimate business purpose, which mirrors language routinely used elsewhere in anti-discrimination law. Yeah, it's, it's really not a problem. What that's contemplating is basically like you have another commitment at the same time. Or your staff is sick, or your equipment's broken, or like insert any other like legitimate business reason. It's not too hard to come up with some, as long as it's legitimate. And you're just not manufacturing it. Not hard to figure out what this would be. Larson's complaint also alleges a violation of unconstitutional conditions doctrine. They reason that the statute conditions their right to promote the religious views of marriage on their willingness to forfeit their right to be free from government-compelled speech. This argument is just a replay of other claims under an ill-fitting framework. Again, it might be an issue of trying to um, trying to argue multiple theories because you don't know which one you're going to buy. And I, th- I think counsel probably was well aware the freedom of speech was the best one because the way the court is addressing this, I'm assuming, is the same way counsel did. And yeah, they're basically, they positioned their argument correctly. We affirm the district court judgment in part, reverse in part, and remand for further proceedings. On remand, the district court must consider in the first instance where the Larsons are entitled to a preliminary injunction, keeping in mind the principle that when a plaintiff has shown a likely violation of his or her First Amendment rights, the other requirements for obtaining a preliminary injunction are generally deemed to have been satisfied. Basically saying to the district court, you probably should grant the preliminary injunction. Fair enough. Kelly, concurring in part and dissenting in part. Okay, I'm just going to take a sip of water, and then we will continue on. At this point, I would like to remind you, if you've not done so already, please like this video, and please subscribe to me. 
I would like more subscribers. Last time I checked, I had 14.99. You could be the 1500th subscriber. And I'm also approved for monetization. So hey, if Super Chat is working and you feel like donating me money under Super Chat, that would also be fine. I'd like to know that my Super Chats are working. I think I approved this video for monetization. Anyways, carrying on. Larsons want to expand their videography business to provide wedding services, but do not want to supply those services for same-sex weddings. Minnesota has a general anti-discrimination statute that prohibits businesses from discriminating against individuals based on certain protected characteristics, including sexual orientation. The Larsons filed this lawsuit to obtain an exemption that would allow them to deny service to same-sex couples. The court today correctly rejects many of the arguments as to why they're entitled to such an exemption, and nonetheless concludes that the First Amendment protections for free speech and free exercise of religion are likely to entitle them to relief. From this holding, I must respectfully dissent. So let us see why our third um, lawyer, or third judge, does not think the freedom of speech argument is very good, because I think it's very good. It's not monetized. I thought I authorized it for monetization. Bummer. Uh... Let's see, monetization. Now it says enable monetization. Oh well. Yeah. Let's see, where am I? No court has ever afforded. Uh, no court has ever afforded affirmative constitutional protection to private discrimination. Indeed, case law has long recognized that generally applicable laws like Minnesota's may limit the First Amendment rights of an individual in his capacity as the owner of a business serving the public. Although religious and philosophical objections to same-sex marriage are protected by the First Amendment, such objections do not allow business owners to deny protected persons equal access to goods and services as inter neutral and generally applicable law. Instead, this court tries to recharacterize Minnesota's law as content-based regulation of speech, asserting it forces the Larsons to speak and convey a message with which they disagree. Neither is true. The Larsons remain free to communicate any message they desire about same-sex marriage or any message or no message at all. What they cannot do is operate a public accommodation that serves customers of one sexual orientation but not another. And make no mistake, that's what today's decision affords them a license to do. Yeah, I don't like this analysis at all. This kind of goes against a lot of First Amendment law. You know, it's generally not acceptable First Amendment argument to, for the government to say, yeah, we're prohibiting your right to speak in this context, but not in other contexts. Like, it would be like, and this is an extreme example, obviously, but it'd be like the government saying, uh, yeah, we've banned newspapers, but it's okay because people can still write books. Um, or, you know, we've banned TV, but it's okay because people still have radio. Or, you know, it's okay that this business can't communicate on billboards because they could communicate on, I don't know, insert some other thing. So, you know, just because you have other avenues is not usually a good First Amendment argument. And when your business is designed for speech, yeah, it allows you to operate a business that discriminates, but the, business, the nature of the business is speech-oriented. So... It would be the same as if it were a newspaper. That's the same analysis. So would a newspaper be forced to like, if a newspaper were to write articles about how much they hated gay marriage, would they, would they be saying that they have to write articles about how gay marriage is great if, if they posted, you know, that kind of content? I, I don't, that doesn't work for me. The axiom that places of public accommodation are open to everyone is deeply rooted in the American legal system. Since at least the 16th century, the common law recognized that innkeepers and common carriers were obliged to serve all potential customers. Yeah, the innkeeper one in particular is really important. After the Civil War, states began to codify these protections through public statutes to protect African Americans through discrimination. Yes, they certainly did. The federal government followed suit with the Civil Rights Act of 1875 and later the Civil Rights of 1964, Title II, which contains the current requirement, all persons shall be entitled to full and equal enjoyment of good services, facilities, privileges, advantages, and accommodations of any place of public accommodation without discrimination or segregation on the ground of race, color, religion, or national origin. 
I'd like to take note that the statute does not say anything about sexual orientation because it was written in 1964 and you wouldn't expect it to. So that's a mistake because you're reading, you're, you're referring to these generalized statutes which protect against other kind of discrimination. They're off point for the issue that you're trying to reach. Uh, they just are. Public accommodation laws enforce the basic and fundamental right to be treated as an equal in American society. Private discrimination saps the moral fiber of the nation and mars the atmosphere of a united and so classless society. Yeah, th uh, this is also kind of a weak thing for a court to do, and I would argue a mistake. When you're citing like, just statements of random senators, random congressmen from the floor, that's not really a good th thing to do that helps you like understand a statute. The problem is that the statements of any given senator or any given congressman don't say much as to the intent of Congress as a whole, right? Just because Senator X said whatever about a statute doesn't mean that's Congress's as a whole's understanding or meaning or intent for the statute. So citing Congress, citing a member of Congress, even citing a committee um, is, is not really good for him. Now, sometimes Congress will actually, in the statute itself, cite provisions as to their meaning. They'll actually put it in a, stat a section. And that's perfectly fine to cite because Congress passed it. But random statements from the floor are, are not great because... They don't tell you any. They don't tell you very much about what Congress meant, even if they're the author of the bill, right? Even if it was Senator Kennedy who proposed the bill and wrote it, that speaks to what he wanted it to mean, but it doesn't speak to what Congress wanted it to mean, right? Because Senator Kennedy is not the same thing as Congress. Mm. In that vein, Minnesota enacted the Minnesota Human Rights Act more than 130 years ago. The statute originally provided that all persons of every race and color shall be entitled to full and equal enjoyment of public accommodation. Like other states, Minnesota eventually broadened the scope of the protections to cover a wider swath of business and larger number of protected classes. The current law defines a place of public accommodation as a business accommodation, refreshment, entertainment, recreation, or transportation facility of any kind, whether licensed or not, whose goods, services, facilities, privileges, advantages, or accommodations are extended, offered, sold, or otherwise made available to the public. That's pretty all-encompassing, right? The current statute contains two anti-discrimination provisions. The public accommodation provision prohibits denying anyone full and equal enjoyment of goods or services of race. The business discrimination provision makes it unfair for business to intentionally refuse to do business with or refuse to contract with or discriminate in basic terms, conditions, or performance of contract because of a person's race, origin, color, sex, sexual orientation, or disability. Minnesota's decision to add sexual orientation to the list of protected characteristics was driven by substantial evidence of sexual orientation. Okay, this is like the part where the court loses me a little because I don't really care. I don't really care what their motivation for adding it is. It's part of the, it's part of the plain text of the statute. It's totally unnecessary. Like, when we're talking about the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment and we're looking about history, uh, we were mainly thinking about the 14th Amendment. Um, because that was where the question was. Obviously, the 13th Amendment is slavery. Obviously, the 15th Amendment is voting rights. But when you're looking at the 14th Amendment, it's written in the same breadth. So it's obviously in the same sort of context. So when you're looking at the 14th Amendment, like it's principally about race. It's not like that hard to divine. Um, here, you, would, you don't have to do those kind of mental gymnastics because it's just in the text. So like me, like a straight textualist, I would just say, oh, it's in the text. I don't need to go any further. Why do I care about history? It's in the text. I don't need to know that sexual orientation is important because the statute's text tells me sexual orientation is important. Skip, skip, skip history. Skip, skip, skip some more history. Uh, skip, skip, skip some more history. Minnesota is not alone, blah, blah, blah. Uh, many religious groups support this. I don't care because each person is entitled to their own religious beliefs. So sure, other religious groups think it's great. Totally irrelevant to the issue at hand. Skip, skip, skip. Uh, skip, skip, skip some more. Okay, so now we'll get down to some stuff that might matter. 
The Larsons have sincere views about marriage root deeply held in their religious beliefs. They are Christians who base their beliefs in the Bible. In particular, the Larsons disagree with views and message that same-sex marriage is morally equivalent to the historic, biblically orthodox definition of marriage as between one woman and one man. Incidentally, here, before we press on, once again, whether or not you believe that's an accurate description of what the Bible actually says is irrelevant. They think it's an accurate, des accurate description of the Bible. That's all that matters. Because they're entitled, as long as it's a genuinely held, genuine, genuinely held religious belief, they're entitled to their religious belief, no matter how idiosyncratic that belief may or may not be in anyone else's opinion. Their religious and philosophical objections to same-sex marriage are entitled to respect. I, I do take a bit of uh, exception of saying religious and philosophical in the same breath. A philosophical belief is, is not quite the same as a religious belief. The Constitution does hold religion as a separate class. And to just say it's philosophical, I think, is to do them both disservice. It's not within the judicial ken to question the centrality of particular beliefs or practices of faith or validity of particular interpretations of creeds, right? You can't get into whether or not they believe it or whether or not it's proper. For many people, these are not trivial concerns, but profound and deep convictions, accepted as ethical and moral principles to which they aspire, and thus determine the course of their lives. The First Amendment undoubtedly protects the Larson's ability to advocate with the utmost sincere conviction that, by divine precepts, same-sex marriage should not be condoned. Incidentally, citing Obergefell, which is nice because that was the case that that was the case that legalized same-sex marriage nationwide. Obergefell. So Obergefell itself says that people still can advocate against that. So nice, nice site. But this case is not about the Larson's view as individual citizens to worship freely or speak openly. It's about their rights as owners of the Telescope Media Group, a Minnesota for-profit corporation. TMG provides a variety of video and media production services to the public. TMG does not currently make wedding videos, but the Larsons want to expand TMG to include the service. The Larsons aver, which is they offer, that they desire to use their unique storytelling and promotional talents to convey messages that promote their beliefs. To that end, the Larsons want to offer video wedding services, but they don't want to provide to same-sex couples. Larsons concede that by offering video services to the general public, TMG qualifies as a place of public accommodation. As a for-profit corporation, it falls outside the exemptions, include in law for religious and secular nonprofits. Fair enough. The public accommodation provision therefore, thereby prohibits TMG from denying anyone full and equal enjoyment of services based on sexual orientation, and business discrimination provision prevents it from discriminating in terms of contract based on sexual orientation. Minnesota has guides stating these provisions mean a business that provided wedding services may not deny services based on sexual orientation. You see, in general, I would agree. But, again, we're talking about speech. We're not just talking about services. We're talking about speech. So there's a difference. Someone said, welcome to why marriage isn't 14 anymore, as the Bible would have it. Yeah, I mean, you know, fair enough. And, uh... Yeah, but people are entitled to idiosyncratic beliefs, and they're entitled to be what some people would call cafeteria Christians. You know, some people say, oh, you're just picking and choosing uh, provisions you like. Well, for better or worse, people are allowed to do that. As far as the law is concerned, as to what God would uh, agree with, you know, that's the subject for another person. I am not God. I know. It's disappointing, but it's true. Larson's also expressed a desire to create a website that includes the following disclaimer. Because of TMG's owner's religious beliefs and expressive purposes, it cannot make films promoting any conception of marriage that contradicts its religious beliefs that marriage is between one man and one woman, including films celebrating same-sex marriage. This is interesting that they want to put up this disclaimer. Now, this disclaimer might, not, might be different than the actual services itself. Now, I'm not an expert on uh, housing law, for example. But as memory serves, and don't quote me on this, if you are if you are living in a property and you have like less than four properties, I think it's legal for you to discriminate on the basis of race. Don't quote me on that. Um, but even though you can, you can't advertise it as such. So if you have less than four properties and you're living in one of them, it's legal, I think to discriminate on the basis of race, but you can't like put that in your ad. 
Um, so even though you can like re refuse to let them rent, you can't put it out there. So it might be legal for the state to say you can't put the statement on your website and still uh, legal for them to discriminate. So just an interesting aside uh, that I thought you might find interesting. The Larsons bring this lawsuit to enjoy application of the statute as providing exemptions from public accommodation. <clears throat> they assert causes of action under the First Amendment protections for free speech, expressive association, and free freedom of religion. Before addressing the various claims, it's necessary to say a few words about judiciability. Judiciability is basically the power of the court to do something about this case. Also, standing is relevant. Both standing and ripeness are limitations and must be considered even if not raised. Absolutely true. Consider ripeness, which is basically saying this case is brought too soon. Courts consider the hardship caused by delay, the extent to which judicial intervention would interfere with administrative action, and where the court would benefit from further factual development. The touchstone of ripeness is where the harm has, has matured enough to warrant intervention. Similarly, to bring standing to bring pre-enforcement First Amendment challenge to a statute provides criminal pending. Provides for criminal pendant penalties, there must be a credible threat of present or future prosecution. Whether the losses claim are judiciable hinges on whether the course of conduct is prescribed, forbidden. To violate either of the provisions, a business must do two things. First, it must treat a person differently than it treats someone else, either by denying the person full and equal enjoyment of goods or by engaging in discrimination. And second, that difference must be because of the characteristic. As applied to this test, whether the business model violates the test depends on what service they generally provide and whether they deny the service because of the characteristic. For example, a bakery that does not make cakes does not violate the statute by declining to bake a wedding cake because it's not treating them differently than it would anyone else. Because we're at the pleading stage, our only guidance comes from the complaint. TMG currently offers a wide variety of video media production services, but does not offer wedding services. So if a same-sex couple approaches today, Larson would serve them to violate the statute because it does not currently make that service. But the complaint alleges Larson's want to expand, specifically the creation of it. A couple seeking the service will pay the video for the event. The Larson's are masters of their own complaint and must exert, accept the service that they want TMG to provide. With this understanding, there's little doubt that the offerings of the films uh, Offering to film heterosexual but refusing to film homosexual purely because of homosexual would violate the statute. Larson's concede as much, alleging that they want to expand to offer, but only because the statute prohibits them. Yeah, it does. It does, obviously. And you have to concede that. This entire argument depends on that. The court up. Uh, opinion attempts to cast some doubt as where the plain text will require TMG to provide wedding services for same sex if it offers it to heterosexual. The imp implication is the statute only would prescribe the conduct because Minnesota reads the law that way. For their part, Larson's argument would not create a film celebrating. This argument appears to be premised on the idea that TMG would not provide is not wedding videos, which is how it's phrased, but op opposite sex wedding videos. Yeah, that's that's a lame argument. Yeah. Yeah, and this argument does fail. Under the statute, a business cannot define services in such a way to incorporate discriminatory characteristics. Yeah. It's like saying, I offer, I'll, I'll marry a man and woman regardless of your sex. Yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah. The Larsons cannot define their service as opposite sex wedding videos anywhere in a hotel can recast the service as white only lodging. Nor did the Larsons attempt to do so. That's because the statute does not prohibit TMG from treating customers differently based on sexual orientation. It provides deny any person enjoyment because of sexual orientation. To conclude otherwise, we redefine discrimination. Yeah, no one's trying to do this. This argument is off point. Um, and now we're going to talk about discrimination on characteristics has to become intertwined with other characteristics. Yep, that's fine. So basically you're discriminating based on one reason, but you're really like discriminating on against a protected reason. So I don't know what would be a good example without being like stereotypical, but you know, insert your stereotype of choice of, you know, I won't answer, do anything that with a customer who has X where X is the trait only one race is likely to have. Accordingly, intentionally, providing, intentionally refusing to provide services is prohibited conduct. 
Larson has made clear they refuse any status of service to any wedding. And the only reason they do so is because of the sexual orientation. Okay. The statute requires that the, conduct, the, the service be the same. Yes, we know. Um, I recognize the complaint alleges the reason for the differential treatment is not because of prejudice, because they disagree with the message, but it does not make their intended conduct non-discriminatory. No one's arguing it does. That's not the issue. They, they're, they're agreeing that it's discriminatory. That's, that's not the issue. Why are you talking about stuff that's not relevant? In the First Amendment analysis, the court focuses on a question that's not before us. Whether the statute could require a business to express a specific message to which it objects, such as writing a racial slur on a cake or tattooing a religious message on someone's kin. Okay, that is not a fair characterization. The court is not focusing on those questions, and you know better, and you should be ashamed. The court is using those as parallel examples to help illustrate the example at point. They're saying, look, here is something we're dealing with, and here's some other examples that are would flow from this as sort of logical next steps. So they're not focusing on these questions, and you know it's ridiculous that you say they are. It's, this is like just analytical reasoning 101. You're being very disingenuous. At oral argument, Minnesota represent it would not view a denial of services as a violent statute because it's not discrimination because of the protected status. Okay, yeah, that's fine. And citing Masterpiece Cake, blah, blah, blah. Because of Larson's offer that they want to offer services only to couples of one sex and not the other, they have standing, and it's right for decision. Yeah, I don't know why you're arguing this. The, 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 uh, uh, the primary um, opinion also says they're standing. So why are you arguing, spending all this time saying, yeah, they're standing? Okay, if videos are free speech. Yes, we know. Uh, content and content neutral speech. Yes, we know. Um, a law is content neutral if it serves purposes unrelated to the content of expression. Yeah, so basic uh, basic examples include like time, place, and manner is the classic example. Um, you know, you can give a speech in a park, but you can't use, um, you know, equipment that makes, you know, too much noise or something. All right. The statute neither compels speech nor target speech based on content. That's true in general. It doesn't. That's true. The statute in general doesn't. It's the specific application. So I guess that's why an as applied challenge rather than a facial challenge. So that makes sense. In fact, the law says nothing about speech at all. It's true. It doesn't. Um, the Supreme Court has re repeatedly reaffirmed the views targeting discrimination do not on their face target speech or discriminate on the basis of content. Yeah, correct. Um, but we're in a very specific content. You know how I say a lot that law is fact specific? This is the kind of thing I'm talking about. And the factual situation is rarely relevant here. So yeah, the statute on its face doesn't target religion. The statute on its face is content neutral. Uh, it's not even speech related on its face. It's just in this specific, particular application of this particular kind of business because of the nature of the business. Uh, uh, this analysis is ridiculous because it would be like a law saying that's otherwise neutral. If it's a newspaper, it's still neutral. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Blah, blah, blah. Dismissing the prior case, the court today concludes that the statute operates as a content-based regulation. By court's logic, because the statute prohibits Larson's from op operating the public accommodation to provide only services to opposite sex, it compels them to talk about a topic they'd rather avoid. The court attempts to analogize this to a statute challenged in Miami Herald, a law that required newspapers to print a, print a free reply to any candidate assailed by a newspaper. By analogy, fails from the start. That law regulated the content of a newspaper was deemed content-based and had no bearing on whether a law requiring discrimination also qualifies. I guess that's kind of a fair point. That statute directly implicated speech by its own clear text. It says if you print an attack, you have to print a rebuttal. So that's clearly on its face speech. This isn't, this isn't a facial challenge. And now I understand why it's not a facial challenge because on its face, it's not unconstitutional. On this face, it has nothing to do with speech. This is an as-applied challenge because as applied, this would be a free speech issue because of the nature of the business. So I, I agree and disagree simultaneously. 
The court opinion relies excessively on Hurley, which is dealt with the application of public accommodation to a parade. But this court's discussion of Hurley omits crucial details. In Hurley, the Supreme Court made clear public accommodation law does not on its face target speech or discriminate on the basis of conduct, the focal point of its prohibition being the act of discrimination against individuals in provision of publicly available goods on prescribed grounds. Citing Roberts, the court also stated the public laws are well within the state's power to enact when its legislators have reasons to do so. That are not generally as a matter of violations of the amendment. Of course, if public accommodation laws were content based regulation of speech, they would not, as a general matter, be constitutional. The Supreme Court ultimately concluded that applying the public accommodation law to the parade did not withstand constitutional scrutiny, but did so because Massachusetts was attempting to apply the law in a particular way. A, def- a parade is, by definition, an expressive association. See, this is exactly where, this is exactly where the dissent is getting wrong. This is exactly where it's getting it wrong. It's exactly the case. It's because this state would also be attempting to apply the law in a peculiar way. Instead of a parade, it would be a videography business. And you would say a videography business is, by definition, instead of an expressive association, a free speech enterprise. But the analysis is exactly the same. It's not that the statute's on its face discriminatory. It wasn't in Hurley. It's not here. It's that it's the as-applied challenge. So... It's, this is exactly where the dissent is making its, making its mistake, is right here at the bottom of 46, 47. Supreme Court ultimately concluded that applying the public accommodation law to Prater to Hurley did not withstand constitutional scrutiny, but it did so because Massachusetts was attempting to apply the law in a peculiar way. A parade is, by definition, an expressive association. But yeah, that's exactly the same reason that this case is proper, because of the same exact reason. So you made, the, you made a mistake you made a mistake right here. Hurley thus stands for the proposition that facially neutral law may be subject to scrutiny if it's applied that way and it materially burdens speakers with time to choose the content of their own message, which is the issue at point. Uh, in cases where law did not significantly impair the ability to choose their own message, such as where the expressive goals are related to the exclusion, the, found, the court has found no violation. Um, yeah, that's true. <laughs> But again, it's it's specifically because it's speech. It's not association like it was in the military case. It's not. It's because it's speech. Here, taking the complaint as true, the Larsons cannot show that the viewers of the video would likely understand them to be expressions of the peculiar particularized message of marriage. I'm not sure that's relevant or not. Uh, just because a viewer would not view it that way doesn't mean that it isn't that way. And so I, I don't know if that's relevant one way or the other. Although an artistic endeavor, wedding videos, like other expressive wedding services, do not primarily reflect the views of the wedding videographer, but the couple getting married. Well, so what? It doesn't matter. It's an artistic endeavor, and it involves speech. And there is, it, it doesn't matter like what the primary is. If you're providing creative input that's related to speech, I think that's enough. Blah, blah, blah. Admittedly, the Larsons take great pains to portray themselves more like independent artists telling their own stories than messengers acting on behalf of others. At argument, their counsel compared them to Steven Spielberg, editing the films to express messages consistent with personal religious views. But Spielberg is not a public accommodation. He does not make his filmmaking services generally available to the public. That is a weak argument. That is weak. Just because Larson's want to sell services that are in some manner expressive does not mean Minnesota's content-neutral regulation suddenly becomes content-based. Yeah, it does. Blah, blah, blah. The court's opinion warns above that applying intermediate scrutiny to the statute would invite government regulation wide sloth to protect its speech. Hardly. Law telling independent artists what pictures to paint or newspaper or articles to publish would still be subject to strict scrutiny. But when an independent artist chooses what to paint and then sells a finished product, it's not the same as a boardwalk cartoonist who offers his services to any passing beachgoer. Hmm. I don't I don't quite see the the arguments. A law telling independent artists what pictures to paint or newspaper or articles to publish, but an independent artist choosing what to paint and then selling the product is not the same 
as a boardwalk cartoonist who offers his services to any passing beachgoer. <sighs> hmm. I'm not sure if I buy that. There might be there might be a point in there somewhere, but I, I it needs to be developed more. And I'm not sure I buy it in any case. The cartoonist refuses to paint the portrait of an interracial couple or a woman in a hijab. The state regulation of that expressive conduct via st- content neutral does not sh- trigger sp- strict screening. Hmm. I'd have to think about that more. If, you're, if your business is like just arguing to paint whoever walks by, there might not be enough like creativity in that to be speech. So it might be a different argument. This is a little bit more complicated. If it would be like more like following them around for a day, or maybe like just taking photographs. So if your business is like taking photographs of like anyone who walks by, maybe like you know you a particular tourist attraction, and like you know uh, I don't know a uh, big band maybe, and you you offer to take well that's a bad example because it's in the UK, um, one World Trade Center. So you want to take a picture of a tourists who are coming by and you offer to take their pictures. Is there like enough creativity in that to be a speech issue? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. Uh, I'd have to think about it a lot more. Although intermediate scrutiny is the applicable standard. No, it's not. It would survive in strict scrutiny. No, it wouldn't. In general, public accommodation laws furthering state interests of eviscerating discrimination have are to public good services. Yes, in general, in general, that's true. If eradicating discrimination on the basis of sex is a compelling interest, then so is Minnesota's interest in eliminating discrimination based on sexual orientation. I'm not sure that quite follows. Um, you could make the argument that race and sex are different, but let's assume it's true. Um, something, something about how the law came to be. Larson's arguing no compelling interest is served by applying the statute because plenty of other businesses are happy to provide. The argument of victims of discrimination are free to go elsewhere carries little force. In general, I think that's true. Yeah, in general, I think that's true. You're free to go elsewhere is not a good argument generally. Uh, but this is free speech again, and free speech is different. Isn't there a guy in New York City that takes other people's art and changes it slightly and sell it? I'm sure there is. I have no doubt in my mind that there is. It's New York City. I mean, there are people selling like complete knockoffs of like Chanel bags and stuff, so I'm sure there is. I, I particularly like the guys who do the spray painting. I mean, I know that, like, it's kind of rote, but, you know, because they do it so much. But they do those, like, spray painting, and they, like, get the little blades, and they, like, make really cool, like, uh, skylines. And sometimes they'll do, like, planets and stuff. I mean, I know it's rote for them because they do it, like, they could do, like, a pretty, what seems to be pretty impressive painting in, like, under five minutes. But I think it look great. I'd buy one. I should have bought one last time I was there, to be honest. I just didn't have anywhere to put it. Um, statutes also not only tailored to serve the interest in eradicating discrimination. It targets only conduct, not speech. No, it doesn't. On its face, it does, but on application, it doesn't. Um, blah, blah, blah. Doesn't target religion. Blah, blah, blah. Legitimate versus purpose. High in scrutiny. Uh, yeah. Supreme Court rejected Smith holding a cross board criminal prohibition on particular conduct need not be justified by compelling interest just because it applies in some cases to religious conduct. Yes, again, generally true. Generally applicable laws that generally incidentally inv- in- implicate a religion are not unconstitutional. You know, no one can use drugs. My religion believes in drugs. Too bad. You can't use drugs. You know, just because you have a religious belief. No problem. Um, the court today allows Larson's free exercise claim to move forward on theory it's intertwined with free speech. The theory derives from dicta and Smith. So whether it's dicta or not, even if it's dicta, there's nothing like precluding the court from like using it. Dicta just means you don't have to, but you can still like use dicta as a way of like 
extending cases. It's not like irrelevant. It's just not binding. It's artistic. It's only wrote because they developed technique. It's artistic as a busker, performing a song, constipating an instrument. Yeah, I, I, that was basically what I was trying to say. I, I think I was trying to say that in so many words. It's wrote because they've done it so many times. I, they, it looks, it's made look easy because they've done it a bajillion times. But yeah, I agree, I agree with that. It's a person who knows how to do a really complicated song and knows how to do it easily because they've done it 10,000 times. Yeah, no problem. I agree. And there's a lot of people who do it. And from what I've seen on YouTube videos, it's a somewhat like easy thing to learn, but how it impressed me. So maybe I'm easy to impress. What do I know? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, this will be good. Let's see if they go over the top. By ruling that the Larson's allegations, the statute is subject to and fails under strict scrutiny, the court carves out an exception of staggering breath. Under his logic, any time a state regulation or discrimination conduct requires a person to provide services that express something, the law is invalid. That's not quite what they were saying. The ruling cannot easily be limited. That's a fair point, but be careful. Innumerable company, companies and individuals sell products and services that are in some way expressive. The court in no way distinguishes whether it's holding all or some of those industries. But easy, it might be easy to conclude some of those services are sufficiently similar to videography as to warrant treatment today. And now we get into exactly this sort of line drawing problem, which is exactly the problem between like on the far end, bards are us, write my wedding vow for me versus the Taylor example. It's like, where's this line? And this is exactly why the cake line is so interesting because it, it is one of the best examples that really slices that really thin. Uh, so this guy says, what about bakers, fashion designers, florists? Graphic designers, tattoo artists, calligraphers, jewelers, chefs, tailors, musicians. Yeah, this is this is all this is all exactly the problem. This is this this look. I'm I I I'm a conservative guy. Line drawing problems are like my bread and butter. So like you don't have to convince me that it's a that it's a problem. But freedom of speech is a paramount value. So if we have to we have to like agree, I think. That the extreme end, and maybe this guy doesn't agree because it seems like he doesn't agree. Maybe he thinks even bars are us would be okay to regulate uh, under the statute. If he if he really thinks that bars are us would be okay to discriminate against under or okay to regulate under the statute, then I guess that's a, at least a logically co consistent position. So I can't follow him for illogic if he's willing to go that far. But man, oh man, I don't. I can't go that far. I can't, I can't possibly keep, apply this to Bards R Us, which means for me, I have a line drawing problem, which I fully recognize, but yeah, I'll figure it out somewhere, but it is definitely a problem. Um, are all those businesses allowed to refuse service to gay, lesbians, whatever they conflict with the owner's personal, religious, or philosophical beliefs? What about more traditional public accommodations like hotels? Can any keeper deny same-sex couples access to the honeymoon suite because handing over the kids would express an endorsement of marriage? No. That's too much. It's not speech enough. Handing over keys is not enough. No way. To these questions, the court gives us no answer. It invites a flood of litigation that require courts to grapple with difficult questions about where this or that service is sufficiently creative to merit a similar exception. Yes, it does. And sometimes that's what happens in court. Sometimes sometimes you open the floodgates and you don't know quite where it's going to stop. And this is exactly where, where that would be. Because it's like, I don't know the answer to this question. The florist probably doesn't count. The tailor probably doesn't count. The baker might count. If he's writing words on the if he's writing words on the cake, it probably counts. If it's a photo cake, it probably counts. It's symbolic speech. It's obviously symbolic of a wedding. It's a wedding cake. The very fact it's a wedding cake is symbolic of something, right? So I mean, it's a tough line drawing problem. It's a tough line drawing problem. But it's like, do you really want to go to the end of the page and say, "Bards are us" has to write for every wedding? Do they have to provide? Do they have to write stuff for Westboro Baptist Church? Because that'd be discrimination on religion, right? Westboro Baptist Church believes things. Because that's exactly because everyone just thinks this is a conservative problem. It's a liberal problem too. You know, what if your bars are us 
and, and you're left leaning, so you have no problem with writing vows for gay weddings. You think they're great, and then one day, uh, Westboro Baptist comes into your church, uh, into your business, and says, "Write us vows for our weddings at our church," and now you can't say no because you'd be discriminating on the basis of religion. See what I mean? This swings both ways. This is not just a conservative problem. This is a left. This is a liberal problem too. The court's opinion is similarly not limited by the fact that sexual orientation happens to be protected. His logic would apply to any business that desires to treat customers differently on any protected characteristic, including sex, religion, or disability. And we may start in the business, wedding business. We don't do interracial weddings. We don't film Jewish ceremonies and all. Oh, I will not end there. It's a, that is a very, very fair point. That I will give you a point for. Yeah, It's like if we bust open this dam. Now, this is actually a, a conservative argument. But it's made from the left, but it's still a conservative argument. It's like, where will this end? It obviously isn't going to be li limited to weddings. That's insane to think it would be limited to weddings. That doesn't make any sense. So it's going to go beyond weddings. And it's like, where does it end? That's a very, very reasonable argument. So I, I, I think it's very good. Will it bust open all civil discrimination law? Will it eventually, uh, will it eventually lead to overturning Heart of Atlanta Motel? which is the case that basically says hotels can't discriminate uh, on the basis of race. That's the case that says that the heart of Atlanta Motel can't refuse to rent rooms to interstate travelers because they happen to be black. That's heart of Atlanta. Will this, will this decision someday lead to overturning the heart of Atlanta? It's a very reasonable argument. And see, that's what I mean. Slippery slope is not an invalid thing in law because everything leads to something else. It's all, we, we live in a common law system. Everything leads to something else. So it's not slippery slope to say, well, will this case someday lead to overturning Heart of Atlanta? It, it's a very logical question in my view. Now, I think there are ways to contain it. I think there are ways to contain it. Not for the least of reasons that... The 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments are based on race. And so that gives Congress additional power to regulate on those bases. But even if it does ultimately end, it's like freedom of speech is such an important value. To me, it's like even if it busts open Harvard and Lamb Motel, it's like freedom of speech has got to win the day. I, I, I think it's, you know, I don't think it would, I don't think it will lead to that. But it's a perfectly reasonable argument because, like, where does it end is a perfectly reasonable question. Yeah. In this country's long and difficult journey to combat all forms of discrimination, the court's ruling represents a major step backwards. It represents a new avenue of attack. It certainly does that. You, you know with an absolute certainty that this kind of – you know that the first wedge, right? The first wedge eventually is going to be cited by the KKK somewhere down the line. You know it's going to happen. It's unremarkable the Constitution and laws of various states can, in some instances, must protect same-sex couples in the exercise of their civil rights. One second. Minnesota has chosen to do so through the H MHRA public accommodation and business discrimination. Like all laws, it conducts, targets conduct, not speech or ideas. Yes. In its, in its broad, it does. This is, this is speech. This has to be speech. Well, I don't know that it has to be speech. There are pure forms of speech, but still. The Supreme Court has already held that this statute is constitutional. Yeah, in general, it is. I would affirm the district word in poll. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Okay. So that's the end of the argument. So the dissent, the, the, the dissent does have a very fair point. The dissent's point is where does it stop? And that is, that is a good, that is a good question. And for a conservative, that's an extremely good question. Where does it stop? Cause that's what we're always concerned about is where does it stop? And it's like, yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. It's just like we believe in freedom of speech as a paramount value. Um, and it has to win in the end. And we hope that everything else is going to work out. I know that's not a great answer, 
but it's the best answer I have. Um, so that's all I have. Are there any questions beyond that? You know, thank you for thank you for chiding me on hydrating, right? <laughs> I don't have super chats enabled. Yeah, I don't. I thought I did. I thought I enabled it, and it shows as monetized, and so I got nothing. Uh, as long as I'm lunch streaming, let's do some sort of YouTube stuff and try to figure out why I don't have super chats. And you can ask me questions, by the way, while I'm looking this up. So if you got any other questions, I'll be happy to answer them. I have no questions to answer. I feel very, very weird just standing here in silence. Oh, yeah, okay. Super chat, enable. Commercial product, blah, 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 whatever. Uh, oh my God. I have, to, I have to sign a different agreement for this. I'm not going to read this in any way. I don't have a company name. I need a company name. I don't know. What should my company name be? Blackleaf LLC. If you cut the tags off your mattress, no, you will not go to jail. The mat, the tags specifically say not to be, not to be removed except by consumer. You are the consumer. You have every right to remove your mattress tags. It is 100% legal. It says so right on the tag. Okay, Super Chat status is now on. Will someone refresh the page and tell me if they can Super Chat now? Uh, if so, give me a buck. <laughs> Black Life LLC, yeah, no, that's that's a good name. Why not? <laughs> Viewers could now send super chats. Yay. The button has appeared for you. Yay. So now now you can super chat. <laughs> well, that was good. Anyways, that's all for now. I hope this has been helpful. I enjoyed this. I think the dissent made made one that made the one critical error, basically saying and, and not really looking at this as an as applied challenge. But they are worried about the consequences of it. And so I'm sympathetic to that problem. But I think the majority has it right. I don't think the Supreme Court's going to take this case, um, so I would not. I, I of course fully expect it to get appealed. The Eighth Circuit might hear it on banc. That's always possible. It's a major case, so I think the probability of the Eighth Circuit hearing it on banc, I'd say probably twenty percent chance. Um, I don't think the Supreme Court takes this case. Uh, they might, they might to affirm it because as far as like. Setting the principle goes, it's actually a pretty good case because it's much closer to the to the pure free speech issue. And so 
it would be it would be probably a good idea for the Supreme Court to hear this case. I don't know that they will, but it'd be a good case for them to hear and affirm because it's 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 much closer on the free speech angle than the cake issue, and it would be nice to like establish the principle as a case in a case that's much cleaner because you know this issue is not going to die. You know it's going to come back someday. And so you, it would be nice to be able to take an opportunity that's relatively clean like this one and say this is speech. It's clearly speech. And therefore, the law has to bend in this situation and write some other stuff to help give yourself some guidance to set the groundwork for a future case. Because you don't, you don't really don't want the first time the Supreme Court says this to be in the most controversial case possible. You know, ideally, you don't want it to be a masterpiece cake. Even if it's legally the right answer, it's such a divisive case that you don't want that to be the first time you say it. You ideally want the principle to be set up in much less controversial cases. And so, like, in these non-controversial contexts, you have cases that stand for this principle. So by the time you get around to the controversial case, you can simply say, well, this just follows from all the stuff we have, and the outrage won't be as much because you have... You have primed people for that decision so that you're saying it's not that you're changing what you would do in the controversial case, but you're priming people for the expectation. You're not just suddenly hitting them in the jar of a super 5-4 controversial case. You know, that 5-4 controversial case is going to come, but it'd be better if you set it up in advance. So I actually think that this would be a pretty decent vehicle. And it's nice also because it's being a, it's coming up in a very sort of cleanish context you know this is on a motion to dismiss so it's just the facts as assumed so there's no like complications that there would be in like in a real in a real case you know in the real world with real litigation things get fuzzy and they just get really sort of blurry but this is clean because we don't have to worry about what the facts are because we just assume what the facts are the facts are exactly what the 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 business says they are because it's on a motion to dismiss so we have a nice factually clean situation in a very sort of pure free speech context so this would actually be a pretty good case for the supreme court to pick up so i'm gonna say Yeah, I'll give 20% for the Supreme Court to to take this case. I still don't think they hear it, uh, but I'll give them 20% for them to hear it because I think it would be a good issue. And this is as good as any for the uh, for the Supreme Court to decide it um, because they know it's going to come up and why not decide it now and set the groundwork for what's going to come in the future. Give Give the lower court something to work with as they're wrestling through these issues in the more controversial context, you know, give them something to sink their teeth into as they're, as they're playing around with it. I think that'd be a, a good thing. It would be a good thing for the Supreme court to do. So maybe the, the Supreme court will take it. So that'd be interesting to, if this winds up being the case, uh, the, the, the argument that they wouldn't take it is just that they want to avoid it as long as possible. Uh, so maybe they, maybe the, the, the reason they wouldn't take it is just because they want to kick the can, can down the road and let, and also just let the lower courts develop it more. So, you know, this is one case from one circuit. Maybe they want to let other cases, other circuits pick up similar cases. They want to have more development down below before they take it up. You know, there's there's no classic reason for the Supreme Court to grant. There's no circuit split, really. Um, it's not overturning a federal law. You know, there's no there's none of the traditional hallmarks for the Supreme Court to hear this case. So maybe they maybe they don't. That would be why I would say they not, because there's no traditional hallmarks. But it's it's a good, clean case. It prevents them a good opportunity. So I'll give it a 20% chance. But we shall see. Well, that's all, my friends. I hope you are well. I hope you enjoyed this video. And incidentally, if you could leave a comment, just let me know if you like live streams more or if you like the prepared videos more. Do you like it more when I prepare and edit stuff or do you like this live stream stuff? Um, do you like it more when I read things more thoroughly or do you like it when I trim it down to 10 to 15 minute videos? Um, you know, so how do you like the formats? Um, cause obviously I'm still learning what I'm doing and trying to make this responsive. So I want to make it as good as it can be for you guys. I want to be interesting, entertaining, I want to be valuable, I hope educational. So what do you like better? Give me a comment on that. And, uh, that's all for now. All right, guys. Hope you're well to layer. Cheers and goodbye.